All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, this is our second lecture in our class, uh, God is Essence and Attributes, and we're going to be going to going through, excuse me, uh, early church philosophy, uh, understanding Platonism and Aristotelianism, and understanding how the early church fathers and much of the church, um, you know, incorporated, appropriated, if you will, uh, Platonic philosophy uh, into the Christian tradition to help articulate these key truths of the Bible. And so, you know, we're going to we're going to go through just kind of some key points of that. Uh, again, this is going to be an overview, um, but I'll be giving some resources at the end to read if you like to kind of study more about it. But uh, but yeah, I'll get started here. And my next lecture, I'm going to use, uh, I think, a tool called Snippet to maybe bring in some um, some visual aids possibly to help out. So I was planning on doing it now, but I just kind of completely forgot about it. So uh, again, this, this lecture is going to be probably a little, a little challenging. Uh, definitely some new concepts for everybody here to go through. And, uh, but yeah, it's going to be really, really good stuff. So, all right, let's get started. Well, first let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for tonight, Lord. We thank you for this time to, to be going through this, Lord, to see how, how the church, uh, used your philosophy. Well, actually we're going to learn some concepts that, that speak of your truth, Lord, and, and kind of get us a, an understanding of what, what Platonism and Aristotelianism is. And obviously we, we look to that as far as only what is true and what is from you lord and so we just thank you for this time and help us in our studies and as we grow into a, a deeper knowledge of you lord and understanding how the church used uh greek philosophy in articulating these key truths about you lord so we thank you and we praise you in jesus name amen okay one god is cause and father so the early church continued in the tradition of the new testament in its conceptual understanding of god but in the first generation, those following the apostolic age, we find reflections of philosophical theology in figures such as Clement of Alexandria, Ignatius, uh, Athenagoras, Athena, uh, I can never say that name, Athenagoras, excuse me, <laughs> Irenaeus, and Tertullian, and many others. In the writings, we find similar attributions in the New Testament, such as God, Lord, Father, Most High, Majesty, Almighty, Master, the Holy One, but we also find other designations as well used for God. We see the Great Demiurge, God of the Powers, and All Creating God. However, the fundamental ideas of God are almost exclusively derived from Scripture. The negative adjectives we see as invisible, right? Colossians 1:15, eternal, Romans 16:26, imperishable. 1 Corinthians 15 50 is how we see the Paul the Apostle Paul speak of God and therefore though some scholars do not want to admit it elements of Hellenism are present prior to the New Testament writings now Hellenism is the is the Greek ideals that were basically assimilated into the culture as the Greco-Roman Empire completely took over uh, the ancient Near East right so Hellenism really is, is the the influencing of Greek philosophy and pretty much whatever was was proper to the Hellenistic or the Greek culture. <clears throat> With that said, as we will see, following the New Testament era, philosophical constructs began to form in Christian theology, thus producing a type of language, albeit foreign to scripture, yet necessary to precisely define true Christian doctrine in order to protect what scripture teaches about God and Christ. Now, what, I'm, I don't, what I don't mean to say is that these were essential or necessary in order to have Christian doctrine, but, but rather they became a, a function of divine grammar uh, for a metaphysical construct of, of what these truths of Scripture speak about, right? So it kind of gave us this, this framework really to establish um, some, cur some pertinent doctrines of the faith that came to develop much later on. But first, before getting to that, we need to detour through Greek philosophy, which is kind of a foundational metaphysical scheme for the birth of the church and that we use today. Now, now while modern critics they, of classical theism, they try to discredit it by saying that it's not biblical because the, the early church fathers took Greece, Greek philosophy wholesale into classical theism, but they are greatly mistaken. In fact, the, the fathers were quite critical of pagan philosophy, only appropriating that which functioned to support the metaphysical framework to articulate biblical truths. Now, interestingly, interestingly enough, the moderns, while they are claiming to be more biblical, right, they have actually merely exchanged one metaphysical construct for another, which they have uncritically accepted, and that is Hegelian philosophy, which kind of just a very simple 
simple caption about that. It's, so Hegelian philosophy really sees that the manifestation of God's nature is bound to the unfolding of history. So while we see that God is, Hegelian philosophy see that God is becoming. And we'll get more to that uh, later on around the 19th century, but really that is the philosophy of, of modern theology of the most liberal liberal sense, but we do see that in our even our evangelical uh, theology as well. All right. The one first principle, simple, unchanging, which is the ground of Greek philosophy. So the concept of first principle of all things is the foundation of Greek philosophy. The first principle was not a god, but an it. Aristotle categorized early philosophers into those who saw that all things derive from it and those who did not. The, the first principle, while having variation in exposition, is commonly understood as the first point from which a thing either is or comes to be and is known. At this first point is the beginning of a thing, the nature and essence of a thing, the, the element of a thing, the thought and will of a thing, and the final cause of a thing. He says here, for the good and the beautiful are the beginning of both of the knowledge and of the movement of many things. Now ancient philosophy understood the complexity, yet the simplicity of reality, in saying that there is a first principle of all things presented the, the puzzling concept of what we call the one and the many. And in Christian theology, this was an important aspect that too it needed to account for. Now among the Greeks, the discrepancies arose in that some overstressed one aspect over the other, thus losing this grounding principle. Is it the one or is it the many? You have to be able to account for both of them. Therefore, <clears throat> Christianity found Greek philosophy unserviceable as a prime resource for delineating the inner nature of God, the doctrines of creation and incarnation, and the relationship of God to man and the cosmos. But, to jump ahead to the conclusion, the Church Father's emphasis on the Logos as the creative source of all reality, as in the metaphysical framework of substance and being, they metaphysically guaranteed the general possibility of the correspondence of divine and human thought about God, the world, the other selves, I'm sorry, and other selves, and did so by avoiding pantheism. And that was the that's the that's the 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 divider between the two, right? So basically, any type of uh, cosmology at the time understood that that uh, the material world was it was eternal, right? But pantheism means all, all is God, all is God. But the Christian doctrine of, of God says that God is transcendent, right? He's the creator, he's uncreated, and he's separate from his creation, which is, which is, which is, sorry, he's separate from his creation. Therefore, there is this breach, this divide here, but pretty much all other schemes of thought kept intertwining those together. But the scriptures don't allow us to do that. But anyways, but the one and the many framework led to the question if there are if there are many gods or not. Now Plato did not think this was important. Now Plato again we're going to get into his work to his his philosophy right here but so Plato argued that all bodily movements must be dependent on a previous movement as in cause and effect. But the chain of events of physical causation would flounder off into infinite regress which we'll explain further. So Plato said that the cause of a physical body's movement stems from the soul which generates its own movement and is responsible for the movement of the entire cosmos. Again, so there's something behind the material world. It can't be material beyond material. There's something something that's metaphysically behind it that in itself has existence. There's nothing behind that, right? Otherwise we have what, the infinite regress. So that's what's, what Plato first kind of gets to. And he says here, the soul is prior to the body and can exist without a body. It is the cause of the good and the bad in things in all aspects of morality. It dwells in all things, controls all things that require movement, thus it is the cause of all things. It drives all things in heaven and earth and the sea by its own motions. Now forgive me, I don't go any type of historical background or, bio, I'm sorry, I don't give any biographical information on Plato and Aristotle. So. If you want to read that, uh, definitely look somewhere else. <laughs> We're not going to get into that here. Uh, again, this is just going to be an overview, so I'm more interested in their thought. I mean, we all know those guys are obviously, you know, pillars of really Western civilization as far as the philosophy goes and that kind of thing. Um, but uh, again, I just want to give you an overview of their philosophy so that we can see it uh, on that on that standpoint <clears throat> and how it's how it's brought into the Christian tradition. So, anyways, 
So a similar argument of the all-controlling divine soul led to what's called the first, the one first mover in Aristotle, who said, since change must always exist without a failing, there must be a first agent of change, or perhaps more than one, again, that was part of the question, but which is eternal and unchanging, right? So something eternal, which is impervious to and utterly free from change, must exist to initiate change in something else. Again, it's the first mover, the self-existent, self-sustaining first mover. So Plato started off with the soul, right, kind of beyond everything, and Aristotle got into this whole concept of this one first mover that can't be material, right? It has to be free from that. It must exist to initiate change to everything else. Aristotle notes that it is possible for things to exist and not exist, even in self-changers. That follow this process, there must be something which includes them all and is separate from every one of them. And it is this that is responsible for some things existing and other things not existing and for the continuity of change. And this is what Aristotle calls the prime mover or unmoved mover. And I'm sure many of you have heard that concept. And that is a concept that's become very, what's the word? I'd say in, in modern evangelical thought, it's it, it, it's kind of, he, he, Aristotle and Plato are kind of cast under bad light, where this whole thing of of this prime unmoved mover, this this personless, personal, personalless, unmoved mover is a stoic view of God, and um, it needs to be abandoned. But that's not the, I mean, we're, you know, we're not borrowing, we're not using Aristotle's prime mover and saying this prime mover is God, exactly from the scriptures. But the whole point is to recognize that they understood there was something behind, there had to be something behind the, the physical world, which is constantly changing. But there had to be something behind it that was never changing and that nothing changed it or affected it. Otherwise, what? If there's something that brought change to the first mover, then there's something behind that that had to bring about change that led into this whole change of these sequential events. And so the whole point was getting back to the first unmoved mover. So advancing on Plato's concept of the source of motion, Aristotle writes, there is something which is eternally moved with an unceasing motion, unceasing motion, and that particular motion Therefore, the ultimate heaven must be eternal. I'm sorry, I read that wrong. My bad. There's something which is eternally moved with an unceasing motion, unceasing motion and that circular motion. So there was a same point where the whole point of this motion is a constant. If something is at rest, right, as the first mover would not be, because if he was at rest, he would need to bring about motion. That means something before him has to cause him to bring about motion. Right, so the whole point is getting back to this ultimate place where this ultimate heaven must be eternal. So when we think about motion, okay, so eternal, eternal means there is no motion, because time is really the measurement of motion, and so the whole point was that it has to be something behind that that is not measured by motion, which goes from potency to act, and I'll explain those later. Right. So, anyways, so he says here, um, back to back to Aristotle, then there is also something which moves it. And since that which is moved while it moves is intermediate, there is something which moves without being moved, something eternal, which is both substance and actuality. It has to have these two things together. Again, it has to have all the parts here, all the pieces here. But again, we would say later on that God is simple. He doesn't have any parts. But again, we're trying to understand Aristotle's um, philosophical framework of this first mover. Okay. And he says... Well, that's not what he says. This is what I'm talking about. But anyways, and this mover, which is both substance and actuality, is the first principle. The first principle is necessarily existent and necessarily good. So we see this ethical peace tied into it, right? And we know when we hear the word necessarily existent and necessarily good, right away we think about the God of the Bible. So as we can see, there's some concepts here that have a correlation with Scripture. And I will let Aristotle carry on as he arrives to his glorious conclusion of God, though he could not link it to the God of the Bible. <clears throat> Excuse me. Aristotle's conclusion provided an ontological framework which the early church fathers critically adopted. Again, they critically, they weren't like wholesale taken in, they critically adopted as the metaphysical foundation and grammar to express the unique transcendent God revealed in creation and scripture. And he writes, and I'm going to skip a bunch here that I thought would be impertinent, but I think it's just more confusing than anything. But, anyways, but I want you to especially hear this last sentence. So he says, for the actuality of thought is life, and God is that actuality. And the es essential actuality of God is life most good and eternal. And so what he's talking about here is that 
sentient, a sentient being, right, that has thought is the highest of goods. Okay, so the one that can think and can reason, the ultimate mind is what he's kind of getting to, is that that is the greatest of all goods. And so he says here that for the actuality of thought is life. So true thought is life, and God is the actuality. And the essential actuality of God is life most good and eternal. So good and eternal go hand in hand, right? He says here, this is his last sentence. He says, we hold then that God is a living being, B-E-I-N-G, not B-E-A-N, a living being, eternal, most good, and therefore life and a continuous eternal existence belong to God, for that is what God is. That last statement is pretty fascinating. Again, he's speaking of the God of the Bible. He doesn't know the God of the Bible, but he's understanding that there's what what has to be, be what has to be out there, what's behind all this, right? Because there is an understanding of morality that is of goodness, of true goodness, and eternality that is not affected by time, right? He recognizes that has to be behind the reality that we see. So it's a great statement there that he talks about God as a living being. I mean, these are almost words directly out of scripture. He didn't have scripture. But we can see that, okay, he's onto something here, but obviously he could never bridge it to the God of the Bible. That comes through Revelation. So Aristotle's conclusion of God, he also refers to as the one in the mind, M-I-N-D, with the monad as mind that contemplates the ideas and is the central theme in later Platonism that the ideas exist in the divine mind. Right, so monad is one, right? So this mind, this idea of this great mind of everything, right? And there is a standpoint of what we call ideas that exist in this mind, which creation that we see before us comes from. So the transcendent first principle, also termed God, finds, finds its appeal in later Christian thought in that God would not be God if he were not the source of all being and cause of all matter. Now remember again, the transcendent first principle term God, there was no personal being in the Platonism or Aristotelianism, right? This idea that there's this concept of these divine ideas that existed by themselves, they called them eternal ideas that everything comes from. Almost kind of like the, you know, a cookie, a, a cookie cutter, right? It's the, it's the perfect shape and you're making cookies out of that one design, right? So the, the storm, the, 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 I don't know what you call that thing, the form of it, right? Is the divine idea and then what comes from that are they all the cookie cutter shapes that make the different cookies? Now, obviously, are the cookies ever exactly like the cookie cutter? Uh, the, the, what do you call that? I guess you call it the form. Okay. They're never exactly like that. They're not. They're not. But anyways, this is kind of an analogy to kind of bring us to understanding what they mean by the divine ideas. Okay. So the doctrine of God as one is connected to the idea of God as pure being, from which the doctrines of divine simplicity and immutability are drawn, right? We say God is simple. He's not made up of parts because if he's made up of parts, then the parts actually are greater than the whole because the whole depends upon the parts to be what it is. And if there are parts in God, then there's something before him that had, had given these parts to make him who he is. And obviously, God is who he is through himself. And so that's, the, that's the, the, the normative principle that we have to understand and see, which we will see through the church fathers. Define simplicity is the starting point of who God is. It basically goes back to the Shema. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. And that ultimately answers the one and the many principle. So the monad as mind implies that the one is the source of all. Therefore, the one is unoriginate or ingenerate. Now, ingenerate just basically means it's, it's a negative description of God. So I-N is, is no, right, or negative. Generate means to be generated. God is ingenerate. He's never been generated. This expresses that the one does not have a beginning or end is independent of other beings and is the original source and ultimate cause of all that exists, which God is. He who is suggests that the one is a timeless, unchanging being. And we can recognize this concept in scripture as recorded in John's Revelation 1-4, where he writes, from the one who is, who was, and is to come. So with the Platonic metaphysic, the early church fathers, almost without exception, had the framework to establish that God is a changeless, all-powerful, he cannot suffer or change from anything, from anyone else, from within or without, right? He is the self-sustaining, uh, uh, originate, I'm sorry, unoriginate, excuse me, unoriginate, uncreated being. He cannot change for the better nor the worse. 
He can't become perfect or less perfect or more perfect. He is pure. And so Platonic metaphysics provided this substance and grammar to talk about the God we see in John's revelation. He who is. Because what do we see in Revelation? I'm sorry, what do we see in Exodus? That God reveals himself to Moses as I am, I am, right? He reveals himself merely as his pure existence. I exist. And that's what we see in John's revelation. And then we have a, a, a grammar to kind of provide a framework to explain these things the best that we can. So, all right, we're going to get into the essentials of Platonism. So for Plato, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the one grand idea or theory is that of forms. So forms are the ideas from which all material things originate form originate from. So remember, the cookie cutter shape, right? The form, right? They are objective truths, eternal realities that grounds material reality. These are, the, the ideas are, are bigger than what we can see. We, we see the shadows of an eternal spiritual reality, which should leave us in awe and wonder. That's the, really the whole point of philosophy and wisdom is to be in awe and wonder and to know there's something transcendent beyond that, beyond a reality in front of us. There are more things in heaven and earth than we can see. Thus, the essential point of Platonism, moreness, transcendence, another kind of reality outside of our cave, and I'll talk about cave here in a little bit, but modern thought wants to squash this reality so that in reducing the complex to the simple, mankind can conquer it. He retains control because he can scientifically analyze and comprehend it, which is the shadow of the immaterial reality. So, but Plato is thought to be conquered by this greater reality, which he and we have no control of. Humanity exists in the ideas. They are not psychological constructs as the modern project claims. And what I mean by that is that the modern project disassociates universal truth from reality that we see. Rather, it's what we construct in our mind, that the reality that we project from ourselves comes from our mind so we create that reality we create what's true it comes from here behind the shadows sits an, an order sits an ordered intelligible metaphysical reality of universals and particulars that exist within themselves right these are the ideas these are the things that 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 are is, is really the ultimate reality and that we have to look for and to study and to really as he said be in wonder of but modern man does not want that because that means he's not in control of it and as we'll see later on, really the whole modern project from the Enlightenment came down to man not wanting him to be under the omnipotent God. And we'll get more into it later on. But really, modern man wants to have control of everything. And it goes back to, to Romans, Romans 1, right? About the creation exchanging the glory of God for that of creation and worshiping that instead. And what is the head of creation? Who is the head of creation from that standpoint? Mankind is. So if there's something behind that something behind if there's a, a level of true reality that's behind what we think then mankind is ultimately subject to that reality but again mankind doesn't want that he wants to create his own mind his own construct from his mind of what's true right and good so but we know these universals these particulars exist with themselves for example the color green is always green independent of things that have the color green goodness and justice even if humanity ceases to exist those things are true regardless of a material reality the laws of logic right two plus two equals four are always true always true no matter what but the things that have been created are images or reflections of their forms or essences or ideas as we've been talking about and they are like them or analogous to them so we live in the shadowlands the whole world we see is an image of the world that we do not see right our lives, the Christian life is a metaphor. So think about all the metaphorical language we see in scripture to point to what is the true reality, the metaphysical reality behind the mask of what we see here. So what is the key difference between Plato and modern slash contemporary philosophy? Ethics, ethics. So Plato valued ethics like rocks. They are objectively real and unchangeable. Modern philosophy sees ethics like artwork. We create them, and the social and cultural influx produces variations. So I create a piece of artwork you can say is ugly. He thinks it's good. And basically, that's how uh, moral reality has been contemplated and has been thought of, is that basically we create it in our own minds. Truth comes from our minds. Truth isn't pressed upon us from the outside, from these external uh, realities, these transcendental truths, transcendental realities that are beyond us. So for Plato... His world is vast. The modern world is narrow. 
Well, what's the difference? Well, obviously, if it's vast, it's beyond us. If it's narrow, we can control it. Okay, we can look over, we can study it, we can we can ultimately have a say in what happens. Plato's largest world outside of the cave, and reveals that moderns want to run from that, which is what a loss of control. So the whole cave thing is that. Let me find a little note about that. Uh, I have it here, Renis. So cave is a reference to to Plato's most famous passage in the Republic. It's a book I'm going to recommend for you guys. But it's called the Parable of the Cave where he points to the light outside of the cave that reveals a greater reality than what is directly around us in our caves. When you think of a cave, it's dark, right? You can't really see everything. You're feeling around. But the light outside is what we want to be looking upon. The moderns want to stay in the cave. The ancients, those that truly understand what wisdom is about and philosophy was about, they want to go see the light that's outside the cave and be exposed and be chasing after that because that's where the true reality is at. Okay, anyways, hmm. where was I at? I just lost my space. Okay, so the, the modern paradigm, the modern paradigm says that what is real or true comes down to preference or rationalizing of our desires. And that's what Freud talked about too, as far as our sexual desires, that man is a sexual being, it all comes down to that, to rationalizing our desires. And therefore what is real is subjective. But if there are no subjective, if there are no objective reasons to believe something is real and objective, then there is no reason for anyone to believe anything at all, right? If it's pure subjection, then subjection and reason or rationalizing is still subjective. And so let me, let me talk about that here. So here, um, so why should I let someone's reasoning, which is only a rationalizing of his desires, infringe upon my beliefs, right? I, I can never say a moral ought, right? But why should I? If, if everybody believes or assumes that that, ra that uh, beliefs are from rationalizing, right? And then therefore they're just subjective. There is no reason then for me to, to, believe, to be held by them, right? So if reason is only subjective, then that piece of reason is only subjective too. It's only subjective that it's only subjective. It refutes itself. Do you, do you see the folly there, right? If, 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 it's, if reason is by rationalizing our desires, which are basically, like I was saying, subjective, then that piece of reason that you can come to inclusion on is subjective too. It commits suicide, it does, it's, it makes no sense. Therefore, reason must be anchored to an objective reality, principle or truth. Otherwise, we have no standard of judgment. And I know we talk a lot about that. We talk a lot about that in church, in our, in our sermons, we see that around us, we have to have an objective standard of truth right, to always anchor ourselves to, and it goes back to having the house on sand, right, or the house on, built on rock, right? So modern thought determines that the distinction between man and beast is reason, but modern thought defines reason differently compared to how Plato defines it. So while, while modern thought defines reason as man's ability to be smart, clever, calculated, right, Plato defined reason as one having wisdom understanding and insight into the forms, to the, the ideas. So this use of reason, Plato divided into four categories or levels, uh, <clears throat> what he called faculties in the soul. So the first level of knowledge is reason answering to the highest, which is direct insight to this eternal reality, right? So these ideas, these forms that are out there. It's the unchangeable qualitative form of beauty or human nature or life. This is, this is the ground of everything. This is the light outside the cave. This knowledge makes man human, and this is what separates him from animals, is being able to contemplate these things, to see that light, to understand there is this transcendental reality that's, that's beyond us. Animals, computers, they can't see that stuff. The second level of knowledge is understanding, where one attains knowledge through logic and deductive reasoning. Derivative quantitative truths depend on logic, where conclusions depend on their premises. So when we think about logical reasoning, right, this is that second level of actually using, being able to use these things, these concepts, and to arrive at truth and patterns of truth. So when we say, obviously, logic, right, 2 plus 2 equals four. I almost forgot for a second, right? Um, deductive reasoning. Deductive reasoning is a claim, a premise that we're basically within the statement itself, it is true. You have everything here. Inductive reasoning, thinking about inductive as investigating, you're trying to find the evidences to greater, to add greater support to your assertions, your arguments, that kind of thing. 
But these methods allow us to speak about things that are true. We can say through logic and argumentation that we arrive at a, at a conclusion and it's going to be sound. If we don't have the, the, the ultimate highest of reality, we cannot make these claims. The third level is faith or conviction through direct sense experience where one believes what he assumes in reality without the need to prove it. And we all have these things. We operate on these kind of basics about truth, right? So, um, and this is where we kind of, where our objective sense of reality meets actual material objects, right? So the, the sense of reality, what we know is true, these, um, these ideas meet the material world that we're in. And then this fourth level is the perception of shadows, he calls, which is secondhand knowledge from opinions, reflections, and or images of real things. So, so Plato's order of knowledge outlines the ascent of discovery from the mere shadows we see before our eyes to the reality of universals that we can only apprehend with our minds. <clears throat> we can understand eternal necessary truths. We can know essential natures of things. And that's what it is to get out of the cave. All right. <clears throat> so Plato posited that the reason we can know objective truths like 2 plus 2 equals 4 a triangle has three sides, both always at 180 degrees, and greenness is green at all times because our, our minds are in touch with the world of forms. Ideas like truth and goodness are not produced in our minds. Rather, they, they come to our minds. Our minds apprehend these things. And in coming to our minds, they function as a judge of our minds, depending on our minds, I'm sorry, depending on our minds' conformity to them. Now, we can see the biblical principle there, right? We receive revelation, right, from God. We've been made in his image. There's, there's a stamp upon us that comes from God. And we would say that God has written, right, written his laws into our hearts. And these things of truth, that we, these objective standards, we know that they are true. And they and they allow us to judge, right, our minds to function, judge of our minds, but also depending on our minds' conformity to them. When we become united to Christ, the Christian life is to be conformed into his image, right? To be conformed into the, the new likeness of God after his image. And the world itself does not want to conform to these things. They want to go their own way. Therefore, there is no judge that's, that's upon them. They judge themselves, but they have no objective reality to be a, a wise judge, if you will. Okay. But... That takes us to the question of what kind of mind knows the forms. Now, it is an epistemological question that we need to articulate the kinds of knowing there are, which allows us to see the metaphysical reality behind the mask of the physical world. Now, Platonic thought observes five kinds of knowing. All will begin with wonder. So number one is ordinary, unreflective knowing, sense perception, and common sense. Number two, scientific knowing. Now, in the modern scheme, it uses empirical proofs, uh, testing, mathematical measurement, that kind of thing. Now, the aim of this mode of knowing is to determine what works, what can be extracted or used from a particular object or thing. Now, the problem is the wonder ceases when the objective is, taint, is attained, much like when a, ma if a magician reveals how he does a trick. Once he shows you what's behind the curtain, you're no longer in awe anymore. You're not. It's actually kind of becomes really irrelevant. The wonder is gone because the secret has been revealed. And modern science wants to remove that about everything, right? Because here's the thing. It's all about control. If there's a level of wonder that's behind what we can see, we can't control it, right? That's, a, that's too steep of a price to pay. Number three, philosophical knowledge of reasons. <clears throat> Philosophic, yeah, sorry. Philosophical knowledge of reasons and causes by logical reasoning, such as Plato sought after. Science follows a similar path, but wonder ceases when knowledge is attained, but in philosophy, such end is harder to achieve. And then number four is the wonder within wonder, the, the contemplation of truths for their own sake, where knowledge is this mode of thought that leads to more wonder like that of a child. And that's what we should be thinking of when we think about the, the world around us, but what's behind that reality we, as we contemplate on these magnificent truths of God and who he is, right? And this last one, which is the ultimate level, is what we call mystical knowing. It's the it's the end because nothing else can be suggested. It is an it is an active actual experience of the ultimate. Right? We speak about being in eternal bliss with God. We, we it's, it's it's a standpoint of ecstatic, of an ecstatic experience that we all long for. Now, how we can kind of relate to it now? There's a way of talking about it where 
like in a biblical sense, what this would be would be intimate knowing of another in sexual union and knowing that is beyond yourself, even out of one's self conscious. It is our end which cannot be put into words. And that is the whole point of philosophy and indeed of human life itself. It's getting to that, right? We, we know that there's this communion, this level of communion we want to have with our God. And we know that the Spirit, right, the Spirit speaks words and utters words that we can't say when it comes to even our prayer life. And we are all longing for this experience of ecstasy. And unfortunately, the world has completely gone the other way where it wants that same experience that there's no words for, but it's an inner experience of, of our self conscious that we have with something that's beyond us. And so the world recognizes that, but it can't achieve it on its own. It goes through means of of experiencing drugs, experiencing alcohol, of doing things uh, of that, that of, of this, it's this constant trying to get to that point. But we know that we will reach that in Christ. We'll reach that in this world to come. And so philosophy becomes a means of trying to elevate our hearts and our minds to that, right? As we look for the later reality that we're going to have. So the expanded horizon Platonism gives to metaphysics and knowledge has profound implications for the human ethic, thus human existence. Again, it goes back to the ethics piece, right? And what is man, right? So the question pertinent to all of humanity is, what ought I to be and do, right? What ought I to be and do? And it's grounded in metaphysics. If we are merely bags of flesh formed through random chance processes, which are just nothing more than chemical reactions taking place until they run their course, then all that matters is doing what one can do to meet one's temporal needs. There's no ultimate final cause to who we are as humans and the purpose that we have based upon God's ideas that he's now brought into existence. And if nature is the final reality, then meaning and purpose end here. But if one can know the absolute good, then one can judge relative standards by the good, including my soul and the community in which one exists. So seeing the good with our souls and functioning off that objective standards gives human a basic foundation of ideas to judge all other things. If not, then someone else has to play God, a tyrannical, idolatrous one. But then again, compare to what standard? So I hope you kind of see this correlation between proper philosophy, intentional philosophy, philosophy grounded in wonder, grounded in ethics, grounded in an objective reality that's out there in its relation to human life. And that's what philosophy was ultimately geared upon. But again, the modern man, modern philosophy, doesn't want to have that wonder that's behind what we can control. Because why? That means there's a, there's a God out there. But the other standard is what? That someone has to play God. But again, what is the standard? All right. So number two, this is going to, we're going to go into Platonism and Christianity. So Genesis 1.27 is the essence of Platonic thought. God created man in his own image. Image is fundamental to Platonic ideas because created reality is the image of the eternal spiritual reality. These ideas for Plato are the eternal archetypes, and things are the representations of the ideas which Christians, especially beginning with Augustine, located in the mind of God. Three differences exist between Plato and the Bible. One, so Plato taught that there are abstract eternal essences. The Bible teaches there is an eternal, single, personal, triune essence, the I am, who is the subject who necessarily exists, not the object as Plato's ideas were. Number two, in scripture, man is subject is a subject, the one who alone is made in the image of God. And number three, for mankind, the heart, not specifically the mind, is the location of the faculty of loving and choosing. So scripture, though, however, has examples of Platonizing, such as Jesus in John 4.34, when he says, excuse me, that his food is to do the will of his father. Here, Jesus is using uh, a matter to the image of spirit, right? So he does the same point where he uses the physical reality to point to the spiritual reality. Uh, Paul does the same platonic reversal when he refers to earthly fathers as images of God the Father and his fatherhood over Christ from which earthly families are named after. And we see that in Ephesians 3, 4. So the human representation of things are metaphors or images to demonstrate the true spiritual reality. Again, Paul refers to Christ as the image of the invisible God, Colossians 1.15. 
the word made flesh is the physical image of an immaterial divine being. So philosophy, all this stuff, it culminates in the Logos. This is where Aristotle, this is where Plato, none of them understood the identity of the Logos. They understood this thing, but they could never actually bridge it to obviously what we see manifested in scripture. <clears throat> While it has a dozen meanings, the Logos can be brought under three headings, metaphysical, psychological, and linguistic. So number one, Logos means, first of all, realness, essence, form, unity, and principle. Number two, it also means wisdom, understanding, knowledge, reason, or logic. And number three, it also means word, words, language, revelation, or explanation. So in these three categories, now track with me here, Logos number three is a mind's externalization of number two. So number three, again, it's about words, language, revelation, or explanation. So number three is a is the explanation of a mind's the externalizing is explain, right? Externalizing is language, speaking, right? It's going to be the, the linguistic piece. So number three is a mind's externalization of number two, right? Which is what was number two? Wisdom, understanding, knowledge, region, logic. So number three is a mind's externalization of number two, as logos number two is a mind's internalization of number one. So for example, number three, right? Communicates, reveals, explains externally. Number two, wisdom and knowledge, which is the mind's internalization of number one, form, essence, truth, and principles. So this is the order of Logos, the order of understanding how this all comes together to where we can actually have this proper hierarchy of how we express, how we communicate, how we explain, right? We externalize wisdom, knowledge, and reason, which ultimately comes from number one, which is what? Realness, essence, form, and unity. So essence, form, and unity, knowledge, <clears throat> reason, logic, and then language, revelation, or explanation are the, are the tiers here. So the history of philosophy reflects a denial of these three things, and that pre-modern philosophy, ancient and medieval, centered on metaphysics, which ended in Nominalism, which which really well, we're going to get to later on, but nominalism is the idea that things just have names, right? There's no intelligible universal. So nominalism is basically you're just kind of coming up with a label for something, and there's no inherent universal truth about that. And the the name associated with that is William of Ockham, and I said we'll get to him later on. But modern philosophy, as originated with Descartes and Bacon, centered on epistemology, right? The understanding of knowledge which resulted in the empirical skepticism of Hume and Kant, who claimed that objective reality, what things actually are in themselves, could never be known, right? So they denied that they had a denial of number two, right? So we first saw in nominalism, denial number one, right? Intelligible universals. The, the empirical skeptics, Hume, Kant, those guys, they denied number two, which is the mind's internalization of these truths, right? actually thinking of these things and internalize and understand them. Contemporary philosophy focused on the philosophy of language, thus manifested in what we call deconstructionism, which is the denial that words can communicate objective, through, objective truths. So modern philosophy seeks to knock out every single one of those key things that ultimately resort back into the divine ideas. Again, if you get rid of these things, then you can do what you want to do, say what you want to say. Now, logos in biblical thought contains all three meanings, essence, thought, and language, in that what? The logos was made flesh. God incarnate in his divine essence created all things by his word, by speaking the world into existence. God gave material reality to his divine ideas. Human words copy the ideas of things. God's ideas come first, from which he creates things that are copies of his ideas. And I'm going to jump a bit ahead here, but Justin, the early church apologist, saw that Plato was an unconscious observer of the pre-incarnate Christ. He understood the Logos was the chief designer, the principle and the truth, but the Logos was an impersonal and abstract concept. So from Justin's point of view, Platonism found its fulfillment in Christ, the Logos, the mind of God. Thus, from that point on, Logos in philosophy had a radical paradigm shift. 
the Logos became flesh. Now, Augustine, we're talking a little bit about his him here, but so his adaption of Platonism allowed him to unlock a vision of God that left him in awe and wonder. Again, going back to that awe and wonder of God. Aquinas accepts the, accepts the basic tense of Plato's ideas, but differs on their independent substantiality. So you remember, so we're trying to locate these ideas, locate this, this concepts back into a Christian worldview. Plato had the ideas that were kind of really independent of their own, kind of existing out there, right? Because why they had no personal God to locate it in. But with Aquinas here, right, they exist in three places. Before things, in things, and after things. So before, as divine ideas, in things, as in the forms that we saw in Aristotle, the forms, right? And then after things, as human concepts. So all ideas exist in God's mind. Every created thing is known by God, the universal in particular, before he creates. And then God put the external form into things, and we abstracted them from matter in order to bring them into our, our immaterial intellects. So... What it means is that all the ideas exist in God's mind. Every created thing is known by God. The universal and the particular before he creates it, right? They're the storehouse in, in, in his mind, right? And then God put the external form into things. The form being that what he gives an individual being or existence to something, right? So we have the form of humanity, right? So he puts the form into these things. And then we abstracted them from matter in order to bring them into our immaterial intellects now this last this last aspect is what we call the doctrine of abstraction from aristotle added to the doctrine of illumination from augustine to explain how the forms get into our minds so our active intellect which extracts the form from the matter is our participation in and the effect of god's intellect thus matter reveals spirit which is the in the universe is what he says is a a kind of appetizer for the incarnation, right? So creation is God bringing form and matter together, right? So the form are the ideas he has, and then he brings matter to them, right? So, but in the form themselves into us, right, is where we have the participation with God. That's how we can actually understand and abstract things, abstract truths, right, from God. So as he says here, active intellect, which abstracts the form from matter, is our participation in and the effect of God, his intellect. So when he means back to the incarnation, incarnation is the ultimate archetype, the divine idea, this, the logos taking on flesh. And so we see this ultimate divine idea realized in the person of Jesus Christ. So I know a lot of challenging stuff there to go through. Um, we can talk more about it you know, later on as well. You know, I'm going to suggest a few books afterwards to kind of help with this stuff. I said, I'm not an expert in philosophy, so this took me a long time to kind of work through and kind of uh, externalize, internalize all those things, but uh, definitely really important stuff here. So, all right, we'll keep going. Now, Platonism has a hermeneutical structure which Aquinas and the medieval church adopted. Because of the Platonic understanding of symbols and images and shadows functioning as masks, the eternal, immaterial, and spiritual reality, God then wrote two books, one book of nature and the other of Holy Scripture. Everything earthly was an image of something of the creator, right? Romans 1, 19 through 20 is the, is the foundation of establishing God's eternal nature, his divine power, that he's revealed himself, right, through the things that he's created. So that goes back to that God has revealed his mind in the creation to us. And the scriptures, along with the book of nature, were full of signs which provided a philosophical foundation for the medieval fourfold method of exegesis, which fostered a literal and symbolic interpretation of Scripture. For example, number one, the Old Testament pointed to the messianic fulfillment. I'm sorry. These are the this is the fourfold method I'm going through. So those are the four points of it. The Old Testament pointed to the messianic fulfillment in the New Testament, which figures along the way functioning as symbols of sign or signposts of Christ and other later revealed fulfilled realities. For example, Moses as a form of Christ, the Exodus symbolizes salvation, right? It's kind of like the, the cross event of the Old Testament being delivered from bondage, right? Um, and the promised land symbolizes heaven. Uh, persons and events in the narrative symbolizes aspects of ourselves and our current lives. For example, Peter's confession of Christ, then his denial of him, right? So we can, we can, uh, 
relate to that, right? It symbolizes things that happens in our own lives. Uh, events symbolize future heavenly events. For example, Jesus heals the physical blindness, which symbolizes the healing of our mental and spiritual blindness in the beatific vision in heaven. So as we've been going through Carter's book and talking about early church interpretation, we can see that there's all these, there's these physical realities, material realities, symbolic realities that point to a divine reality. Whereas the historical critical approach wants to deny those things, right? And only focus on what we can prove, what's historically accurate. And ultimately we have to go through what did the writer ultimately say and give him the final authority in that. But really scripture is God's book, right? He is the ultimate authority. His meaning is what matters. And so we can derive those spiritual truths in the physical reality uh, before us. And that's kind of what's going to be real important here to grasp and hold on to as we go through the church fathers. So, excuse me. The philosophical foundation for this method of interpretation is due to the Platonic understanding that words have meaning, events have meaning, which God carries out, carries out, excuse me, and thus events can rightly be seen as words, as signs, and not just things. Remember, they're there to point to a spiritual universal reality, not things in themselves. They point to something. The modern schematic of destruction, deconstructionism says that the words do not have objective meaning. It denies that words are signs and reducing them down to things that either the cause or effect of power. A deconstructionist mindset reduces the world around us because if humans, if humans depend on words for meaning and truth, then the contemporary scheme shackles people to their caves because they can never justify their assumptions, right? They cannot follow the path of wonder if words can articulate and lead the way to the bigger world. And that was what the early church wanted to do. Early church fathers' interpretation um, up through the medieval, up through Calvin, right? They were in awe and wonder, and they interpreted scripture with that awe and wonder because they wanted to expose and show us the light of God, of the divine realities, that, that if we shackle ourselves to the material only, as the historical critical method seeks to do, if we shackle ourselves to that, we will never get out and to see the true reality of the light shining in. Okay, excuse me. <clears throat> One of Aquinas' most important contrib contributions, which was a crucial distinction added to Platonism, is the doctrine of analogy. And we, we will look into that further, further down the road, but for right now, we're just going to discuss it a little bit here. So, again, the Platonic ideas are the basis of physical reality, with the physical reality pointing back to the eternal reality. Symbolic and literal understanding can't hold together if we don't have the means of talking about them. That's real important. Having the proper language to communicate the truths is, is key to understanding the material and the spiritual. It really is. And I'll get to it here in a second. But So symbolic and literal understanding. Oops, sorry. Okay. Symbolic and literal understanding can't hold together if we don't have the means of talking about them. For Aquinas, reality itself is analogical. We've already mentioned analogical, right? So doctrine of analogy is more than words, language, and thought or concepts. Rather, analogies are first of all in being, B-I-N-G. For example, when we use the word good, it has different connotations when being used as an attribution of God or attribution of man or dog or food, right? This means that the form of goodness is not univocal. That's an important word, univocal, which literally means the same voice with only one universal meaning that must be the same applied to anything, right? So we that means we can never say, we wouldn't say that goodness can be the same in God as it is in a dog or a man or in a good meal, right? Goodness has an analogical predication, which means it is partly the same and partly different when used in different contexts of reality. For example, a good weapon kills. Good medicine heals. So we have to always understand that, that things aren't a one for one when it talks about these two different realities. Rather, there's an analogy that we have to understand and apply in our context. So at the basic element of existence is being, B-I-N-G. The fundamental principle is the separation between God and creatures, right? And it's analogical. According to Aquinas, well, all, I would say all of us, God is being, B-E-I-N-G. Humans have being. God's essence and existence are necessary. 
creatures must be given essence and existence. And so that is the distinction between our transcendent God and his creation. God is. Humans have. God is necessary. Therefore, his existence and his essence are necessary. Creatures, we don't have to exist, right? But God has given us existence from the ideas of him, I'm sorry, ideas of us in his mind. And God gives existence to a thing's essence by creating it. So like we can, we can conceive of a strange creature in its essence, but it is only in existence by being actualized in its essence. So the creating piece that God does brings an existence or it actualizes the essence of what he's been thinking about, of his thought, of humanity. Humanity has an essence, but God brings it to be through his creating it. Now, we would say God is pure existence and essence. Now, Aquinas' distinction between existence and essence is a crucial addition to Plato's theory of forms or ideas. And it came from the biblical revelation of creatio ex nihilo. Creation from a Platonic concept was not that way. It's a Judeo-Christian doctrine, and there's many critics today that want to get away from ex nihilo, say it's unbiblical, and it goes back to the whole idea of a pantheism or a panentheism, that somehow God has to be essentially related to his creation, and that is not part of Scripture. I mean, again, you could try to make some kind of arguments, but really, that is, that is if anything, interestingly, going to a pantheistic or a panentheistic view of, of God and creation goes back to more of the of the the pagan the pagan philosophical concepts that the early church rejected they rejected because they understood that god is the eternal creator creation is temporal and to mix the two together you have a lot of theological problems <clears throat> so for aquinas god knows all essences for they exist in his mind and then he chooses to give existence to an essence in plato all essences are an actual eternality, which means they have their own ideas by themselves. They exist by themselves separate from God. So Aquinas and Plato share in the understanding that all possible forms are located in the mind of God. Now Aquinas did not subtract anything from Plato, but he made an addition based upon the biblical doctrine of creation. Okay. Before concluding real quick, um, I do want to articulate a little bit about Philo of Alexandria. He's an interesting figure. He was a Hellenistic Jewish philosopher um, that really a lot of people loved him or hate him. And he kind of was the first major major character in confronting biblical faith with, with Greek thought. He was alive from around 25 BC to 40 AD. Um, but those that don't like him, they credit him as being the one responsible for, pl for plunging the Judeo-Christian faith into, into pagan philosophy. And it's been debunked many times, but it tends to kind of come up a little bit. But So Philo's view of the God of the Pentateuch is that of one who is intimate and provident, unlike the gods espoused in Neoplatonism. A tenet of Greek philosophy is the view that the universe is eternal. We talked about that. But Philo does not believe as such because it runs contrary to the Old Testament teaching about God's providence over his creation. So in his commentary on Genesis, Philo reflects on God's good creation, which God determined to bring about a corporeal or temporal world, which is perceptible to the external senses, based off his, his ideas or his archetypal idea of creation in his intellect. So we see, or we've already seen this, uh, you know, spoken of earlier about the idea of ideas and that God creates based upon these ideas, right? So Philo is really kind of on our side. Excuse me. God is the cause of all things is indescribable. This is what, again, back to Philo. In fact, the living God, writes Philo, is so completely indescribable that even those powers which minister unto him do not announce his proper name to us. And that's a part, that's that's the section there to where the moderns will have a problem with saying, look at, we talk about this God who is his first mover, he's unknown, he's indescribable, but but they're not they're not properly understanding what Philo is trying to say. And we've already talked about this. So let's go back to scripture. God's revealing himself to Moses as I am who I am. What kind of name is that? Basically, but remember, that wasn't a name. It conveyed to him of who God is, his holiness, his holy otherness as creator. And because of God's incomprehensibility, I mean that's that is true. God is incomprehensible. He wouldn't be God if he was comprehensible, right? But he is apprehendable in the manner that he's revealed himself to us through the things he's given us through his creation but also the ultimately manifested in his son 
All right, get back to it. So, and because of God's incomprehensibility, the light of God is imperceptible to the physical senses, right? That's what the world rejects. But the eye of the soul, the eye of the soul can receive the impression of his appearance and therefore cannot be named. Philo understands that we can only know that God exists. However, we can know God through his relationality and that he gives us a name for which we are to call upon so that, so that man can be brought into relationship with him, connecting his personal nature to the one who sovereignly creates. The fact that God has given us his name, that he, that he brought about later on. So when I say that he's given us his name, ultimately it's Yahweh, which is I, I, I am, I is. But throughout scripture, God reveals himself in nouns. He actually gives different names to us, right, that we see. And then ultimately he manifests himself in the person of Jesus Christ, right, that is the name above all names. So we have this first, uh, not first being, uh, gosh, first principle, which was very abstract. There was no personal attachment to it. And then the early church now brings this concept into play to where we have this, this structure of language to talk about the creator, talk about the first principle, the first mover, all these things, right? And then we have a name given to us, the name of all names, who is Jesus Christ. So we relate and we bring both of these together. So conclusion, the brief survey on Greek philosophy, particularly Platonism's purpose to identify some key concepts that function and still do function as the framework of the early Christian doctrine of God. And we will refer back to this and other aspects of Greek philosophy and Western philosophy in general but we will see that there is these certain strands of thought that we held on to, but there are certain strands that deviated from the Christian tradition. But before moving on, it's important to understand, as I've already said this, but the church fathers did not accept did not accept Greek philosophy uncritically. They didn't use it as their primary means to articulate and teach about the God of the Bible. Rather, they adapted what undergirded the Bible's teaching about God. Here's the thing, we cannot escape the use of philosophy. We all use it but we need to always subject it to the documents of the faith. If it does not align with scripture, we cast it out. Now, second century philosophy found more and more in favor with Christianity in that while it posited that God was impassable, ungenerated, uncreated, invisible, immutable, all these things, right? The Christian scriptures, the revelation of God transcended philosophy because the knowledge of the Father could only come by means of the prophets who were led by the Spirit. Thus, the Christian theology is divine doctrine not of human origin. So while the natural man could perceive these things like we see in Plato and, and um, Aristotle, it was only through the Spirit speaking through the prophets, through divine revelation, that we come to know this personal God. So I conclude my lecture today on Christian philosophy, I'm sorry, on, on philosophy as used and appropriated into the early church. And we're gonna see that play out more in our language that we see that they use. Um, but I hope you kind of get a good, kind of a good, um, what do you call it, nutshell understanding of, of Platonism and Aristotelianism uh, as well. And I got a few books here I'll show you that I recommend um, for further knowing. Um, this one here, really good, very simple, thin book. Uh, Peter Kreeft, uh, been teaching this stuff for, for decades. A great, great teacher. I first heard of him from, from um, Carter. Uh, Craig Carter in his book, and this was really great stuff, great reading. And then I mentioned this, so Plato's Republic, uh, kind of a thicker thicker book, but if you've not read this and you want to really get a good gra uh, grasp of, of, of Platonism, uh, this is a really good one to get into. Some, and it's actually, it's quite entertaining. Once you kind of get to the feel of how it flows, because um, it's all these, these are all a bunch of dialogues that they're having back and forth, but that's how they kind of, that was their style of, of articulating philosophy and, and philosophizing, was having these dialogues and pretty much had this back and forth, almost like a debate kind of thing. But uh, again, really helpful, so I recommend that. And um, again, again, I hope this was in, instructive and helpful. And any questions you guys have, make sure we bring them up in our, in our meeting this month. And uh, that's all I got, guys. So thanks and good night.